First, thank you to Yorkville University for sponsoring this video. Check out the Bachelor for the Creative Arts in the description below. Anyone who has expressed an ambition to pursue a career in artistic work has encountered the same sentiment. Have fun being poor through parents or teachers, friends, family or society as a whole. Don't become a writer, a painter, a musician or filmmaker, a photographer or a sculptor because it is the quickest road to poverty. There is no financial stability and certainly no financial success to be found in such pursuits. Maybe for a very very tiny minority of super talents or those who are exceptionally lucky to be discovered and promoted. So instead choose for a steady career path, become a lawyer, a doctor, or go into finance. Name of the game, move the money from your client's pocket into your pocket. Right. To be honest, it is not necessarily bad advice. And even though I've spent pretty much my entire career in the creative industry, it is not a particularly safe or easy bet. And ever since I turned 30 last year, I was really wondering if I one day have a child that comes to me with wild ambitions about his or her music, painting or poetry or YouTube career, would I encourage her or would I warn her? However, on the other side, I absolutely despise the archetype of the starving artist. Looking at most artistic industries, whether it is writing, filmmaking, music, jewelry design, content creation, there are hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars slushing around in these industries. So why would aspiring creatives not be able to earn a living? The trope of the starving artist is not only something that is put on creatives by wider society, it is also enforced, even celebrated and romanticized by many aspiring artists themselves. Dying broke and drunk and full of heroin at the age of 34 is not exactly my idea of success. I'd rather die drunk, broke at 34 and have people at a dinner table talk about me than live to be rich and sober at 90 and nobody remember who I was. Jeff Goins writes in his book Real Artists Don't Starve about early 20th century art culture in Paris. This was a new era and these creators proudly suffered for their art. Art for art's sake was the motto of these bohemians that willingly embraced poverty and obscurity. They se disent artistes et se conduisent comme des bureaucrates. Chacun d'entre eux est un petit tyran. Un pauvre Gauguin, by the way. Now, there are huge benefits to a pure approach to creative work and a danger of chasing money and fame, which I will discuss later in this video, yet no artist should willingly live in poverty. In this video, I want to explore the archetype of the starving artist, the psychological reasons many creatives seem to struggle with the financial aspects of their work and why the starving artist gets romanticized. And I want to propose a better philosophy that hopefully will help creatives to be bolder and more confident in making money from their work. This video, by the way, is based on the book Real Artists Don't Starve by Jeff Goins, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, but also the psychological traps that I found myself falling into. Now, to understand the romanticization of the starving artist, let's start with one of the most famous starving artists alive, who both embodies the best and the worst aspects of the archetype, my fellow Red Hat and Dutchman, Vincent van Gogh. But first, a quick word about the sponsor of this video. Yorkville University offers a Bachelor of Creative Arts specifically focused on providing students who have a creative background with advanced leadership skills, skills necessary to succeed as an entrepreneur or a leader in the creative industries. So their program not only focuses on developing your creative talents, but just as importantly on how to develop a strong career in your chosen field, whether it's project-based positions or leadership roles. There are a vast variety of careers you can expect to have after completing this program. For example, filmmakers can become production executives or studio heads, actors can become casting directors or talent managers, and screenwriters can become executive producers, consultants, or development executives. The power of this program is that it really focuses on how to turn your creative passion into getting a leadership position within your creative industry. And it can be taken from anywhere in the world. So fully online, fully on campus in Toronto, or a hybrid of both online and on campus. 
It is taught by award-winning active industry professionals and it can be completed in just as few as 15 months. So if you are interested, the program has multiple start dates in January, April, July and October. Learn more about York for University's Bachelor of the Creative Arts by going to the website through the link in the description below. Back to Vincent van Gogh, whose career was famously marked by 10 years of furiously creating more than 900 paintings and many more drawings while only ever selling one of them. He spent his life in poverty, living from the money that his brother gave him. And although the amount he got from his brother was actually more than what, for example, a factory worker earned, Vincent spent most of it on art supplies and what little money he had left for food, he spent on alcohol, mostly absinthe, tobacco, coffee and bread. Even more famous was his poor mental health. He suffered from depression, loneliness and probably a variety of mental illnesses like violent episodes of psychological terror, physical pains and lapses of consciousness. They say that I scream in the streets, that I cry, that I put black paint on my face to scare the children. I don't remember anything. He cut off his own ear and he presented it to a prostitute. His neighbors were afraid of him, so much so that they petitioned to have him locked up in a mental asylum, which he eventually voluntarily admitted himself to. It is important to note, however, that the tortured artist and the starving artist are not the same. Many tortured artists become incredibly financially successful but stay tortured, suffering from mental health issues and substance abuse. And many creatives are not tortured yet they do struggle with their finances. But there is an overlap also in the reasons that both archetypes are romanticized. During his years of poverty and both mental and physical decline, Van Gogh did produce an incredible body of work. Many of his paintings would turn out to be masterpieces and are now worth hundreds of millions of dollars. During his year in the mental asylum, he painted approximately 150 paintings, some of which would become his most famous and valued work, like Starry Night. However, none of this was during his lifetime. In May of 1890, he left the mental hospital, throwing himself even more into his work, creating a painting a day. Yet his mental health declined further. He worried about money and his financial future, while also being scared his nervous attacks would return. And on the 27th, of July 1890 he walked into a wheat field and shot himself although the art theory is that he was shot by someone else he died two days later never knowing how successful and celebrated his work would become it is not a fate you wish upon any aspiring artist yet for various reasons we do tend to romanticize his life and in order to understand why we have to ask the question what makes great art. Because unlike other industries, the value of creative work is often hard to determine and is influenced by a variety of factors that have nothing to do with the product itself. Of course, there is the famous case of the banana on the wall that sold for $120,000, an insult to every sculptor and painter who dedicates him or herself to a technical mastery of the craft. But the banana on the wall at least can be attributed to a publicity stunt and or money laundering. A more nuanced example is Joshua Bell, one of the most successful and critically celebrated violinists in the world, who just days after selling out a Boston theater with $100 tickets, walked into a metro subway with a $3.5 million violin and started playing. Most people walked by without giving it a moment's notice. This and many other examples of the wild subjectivity of art's economic value showcases why a career in creativity does not exactly seem to be a safe financial bet. I would say that there are three factors that are important to determine the value and quality of art. Firstly, and most importantly, dedication to the mastery of one's craft. To put in the hours and become good at what you do. That when the average person looks at or hears your work, they think, I would not know how to do that, which is why sticking a banana on a wall can never be art in my opinion. Of course Van Gogh showcased an unbelievable dedication to his craft, even though he had no formal training. He was passionate and single-minded in the pursuit of his art and in his ambition of becoming better at it. Just his output alone is an inspiration to many artists. Because as Stephen Pressfield writes in The War of Art, 
Most creatives suffer from resistance, the invisible internal force that keeps us from doing the projects we are most passionate about, the feeling that we want to do nothing more than write a book, paint a canvas or make YouTube videos. But as soon as we actually sit down to do it, everything in us screams to run away. I quote, are you a writer that doesn't write, a painter that doesn't paint, an entrepreneur that never starts a venture? Then you have fallen victim to resistance. The more important a core action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we feel towards pursuing it. The fear of staring that blank canvas or empty piece of paper in the face cannot be underestimated. Resistance is a deadly fucking enemy. It aims not to wound, but to kill. Pressfield writes, it might be an overstatement, but Hitler wanted to be a painter, yet after getting just a bit of rejection, he gave up. He decided it was easier to become a genocidal dictator and start a world war than face a blank square of canvas. Looking at the incredible pace of creating paintings, it seems that despite everything else, Vincent van Gogh did not suffer from resistance, yet in his own words, he did very much so. As he wrote in one of his many letters to his brother, you don't know how paralyzing that is, that stare of a blank canvas, which says to the painter you can't do a thing. The canvas has an idiotic stare and mesmerizes some painters so much so that they turn into idiots themselves. Many painters are afraid in front of the blank canvas, but the blank canvas is afraid of the real, passionate painter who dares and who has broken the spell of you can't once and for all. Despite facing not only resistance, but also 10 years of constant and total rejection of both his work and himself, Van Gogh kept painting. He kept pursuing his craft to the best of his ability, producing more than 900 paintings despite constant despair. And for that, he deserves our admiration. Which brings me to the second aspect of what makes good creative work. It evokes emotion. A great song, a movie, book, painting, and dare I say, a YouTube video. It, it moves us. It makes us feel deeply, whether it is happiness or sadness, pain and anguish, or inspiration and excitement. And often the best works make us feel a complicated mix of emotions. And as weird as it sounds, collectively, humanity is willing to pay trillions to artists that make us feel deeply. As Van Gogh said, let's not forget that the little emotions are the great captains of our lives and we obey them without realizing it. So the job of the artist is to become a master of his or her craft, but also to evoke deep emotions in their audience. And if you want your work to evoke a strong range of emotions in its audience, it is logical that you want to infuse that work with your own strongest feelings. Creative work is so often an authentic expression of yourself. If you want your audience to feel deeply, you have to feel deeply, because audiences are smart. They can always tell when an artist has or has not put their heart, soul, their pain, fear and hopes and joy into their work. We can all hear the difference between a musician who plays the notes perfectly but without any feeling and the musician who goes wild, misses a few, but you can feel that they are putting their heart and soul into it. They express passion, grief, awe, rage, happiness, tears of sadness and tears of joy. So the logical conclusion is then that a good artist needs to experience both the lowest of lows and the highest of highs that humans can experience and put all that excruciating pain and euphoric joy into an artistic outlet, an expression of their soul. A good artist has grappled with demons. And this is certainly true for Vincent van Gogh, who had bouts of manic creativity and depression, but also could swing between being extremely happy and anguish. And when these emotions were at their worst, he would throw himself into his painting, putting it all on the canvas. As he wrote, I've put my heart and soul into my work, and I lost my mind in the process. This is why creatives sometimes romanticize the tortured artist, but of course being a tortured artist is not exactly conducive to the boring and mundane task of creating financial stability. And does it actually lead to better work? Even Van Gogh himself said, to do good work one must eat well, be well housed, have a screw from time to time, smoke your pipe and drink your coffee in peace. 
And as Stephen Pressfield writes, the working artist will not tolerate trouble in her life because she knows trouble prevents her from doing her work. Taking good care of yourself both physically and mentally will allow you to focus not only on improving your craft, but also marketing and selling your work. Yet if there's anything that most artists hate, it is selling. As the saying goes, it is not personal, it's just business. But if one of the most important aspects of art is that it is an honest and authentic expression of your deepest self, how are you supposed to deal with the rejection of others judging and not liking and buying your work? Because it is personal. People say that I don't know how to draw, how to paint. They say my paintings are clumsy, ugly. I used to care what people thought, what people thought, but not anymore. Your product or service not selling is a quality or product market fit problem. Your art not selling is a rejection of your soul. How can that not drive you to madness? Also, most people don't want to be perceived as sleazy salespeople. And with creative work, it goes against the very thing that it is supposed to be, honest and authentic. What can chasing money and fame do but corrupt your creative endeavors? Stephen Pressfield describes the definition of a hack, for example. I quote, the hack doesn't ask himself what is in his own heart. He asks himself what the market is looking for. The hack condescends to his audience, but is in fact scared to death of them. Scared to death of being authentic in front of them. The hack panders. It can pay being a hack. A slick dude can make millions being a hack. But even if you succeed, you lose. Because you have sold out your muse, the best part of yourself. Yet this creates a destructive paradox around creative work. The aspiring artist wants their work to be recognized, appreciated, and yes, even bought. But if it is commercially successful, you might also be seen as a sellout, a hack. Your work is inauthentic. The starving artist believes money taints their work. But this is not true. And Jeff Goins writes, the starving artist avoids the money question at all costs. But the thriving artist knows that business is part of art and even money is something the artist must master. Never be afraid to publish, market and sell your creative work. Test it in a market, ask a price for it and see how the market responds. Many creators would like to just focus on the work and let the fans and paying clients come to them. But this is not how it works. It may be true that chasing money and success with your creative work can corrupt it, but so can not chasing money and success. It is the sign of the pretentious artist. The artist who thinks their expression is above understanding his audience and the market. The artist who thinks people just don't get it, only he or she does. It is the artist whose work is a genuine expression, but who is then too afraid to show it to the public and try to sell it. Instead of improving one's craft, marketing it better, or making slight creative changes to meet the market where it's at, the pretentious artist just exclaims, I don't care about money. They just don't understand my work. They just don't get it. But this unwillingness to truly test their work in the market is simply a crippling fear of rejection. She is better at writing than our US presently amateur number two is at tennis. Yet she chooses to hide or just blend in with the rest of you. Why? Now, to be clear, I don't think that this was the case with Van Gogh. Both he and his brother very much tried to sell his work. But it is for many who falsely romanticize his suffering. So how does one become the best of both worlds? The creative whose work is an authentic expression, but who is also not afraid to play the game of marketing and sales. How do you overcome the fear of rejection when you feel like your work is a part of you? As Stephen Pressfield writes in The War of Art, if we think of ourselves as a corporation, it gives us a healthy distance on ourselves. We don't take blows as personally, we are more cold-blooded and we can price our wares more realistically. Sometimes, as myself, I am too mild-mannered and nervous to go out and sell, but as me.ink, I can pimp the hell out of myself. I am a professional. In short, put your heart and soul into your work, but once it's done, distance yourself from it and put it out into the market for judgment without attachment. 
market and sell to the best of your ability and if it gets rejected, analyze why as a corporation would. Also, don't be afraid to do commercial work on commission, at least sometimes. There is a saying in Hollywood for actors, one for them, one for me. One commercial project that pays well and then one passion project that might flop, but that I can put my heart and soul into. And one of my favorite examples of this in photography is Gordon Parks. Growing up in poverty and under the racial segregation of the 50s, Gordon Parks picked up a camera as a weapon. He states in his biography, A Choice of Weapons, I saw that the camera could be a weapon against poverty, against racism, against all sorts of social wrongs. I knew at that point that I had to have a camera. Yet, although so much of his mission as a photographer was to expose societal problems, he was never afraid of well-paying commercial work, shooting a lot of fashion photography for Vogue and Glamour. Now, I know that black American artists in the 1950s working for white elites is a sensitive subject. Its underlying racism is explored in, for example, Green Book. Lovely work in there. Why, thank you. Uh, are you looking for the commode? Yes. Yeah, sir. here, let me help you. It's right out there for that pine. Yet, Gordon Parks was very aware in trying to build bridges and trying to connect two worlds for the better often actively inviting subjects from his work in poorer and segregated areas to his fashion photography exhibition. As he writes, the elites dressed in the furs and finery rubbed elbows with people that I had photographed in the poor quarter. I had invited as many of them as I could find, and about one poor missionary woman he had photographed, he wrote, despite the gathering of beautiful ladies and other affluent people, she was the most sought after. Nearly everyone in the place shook her hand before she finally went home in a taxi that I called for her. Honest and authentic work can perfectly coexist with commercial success and it is up to each creative to play the game to the best of their ability. Van Gogh was an artistic genius and his story is a tragic and a beautiful one, but it was his brother's widow that is the most valuable player in creating his legacy, fame and the worth of his work as it is now. It was her that devoted her life to promoting and preserving Vincent's work, even in the face of rejection and dismissal by the establishment art world, in part due to her gender. She edited and published Vincent's and Theo's correspondence. She strategically lent out Vincent's work to museums and exhibitions while still retaining ownerships. She was in many ways a marketing genius. Vincent's legacy was as much built by his work as an expression of his soul as it was by a relentless marketing campaign. And there is nothing wrong with that. Because real artists don't starve. Or at least they try their motherfucking best not to. Thank you for watching.